welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hi, everyone. On today's episode, I am talking with Chris Burris. Chris is a lead trainer with the IFS Institute, and he was my level one trainer, so I have a special fondness for Chris. This episode is so good. I feel like I'm saying that more and more, but I highly suggest you grab a notebook and a pen and plan to hit the pause button because it's so jam-packed. So here's a little bit of of what you have to look forward to. Um, The first part, we talk a little bit about therapist burnout, and then we spend a lot of time talking about working with inner critics. We talk about the critic shame and firefighter cycle, which I thought was super helpful and really interesting. Chris says that our inner critic is a major player in our system, and this critic is using fear and shoulds and harshness in order to help us be our ideal self and to meet our goals, and that he gives us really this hope of befriending this part of us, and as we befriend it, it can transform. And he talks about um, helping it transform by letting it know there's another way, um, another way to help us. And so it's really good. Lots about inner critics. And then we talk about attachment wounds and just attachment in general. And I thought that was just fascinating. Um, He talks about how a lot of attachment wounds are around to not being heard, not being seen, and not being valued. And how we can help really heal our parts when they feel seen and heard and valued by self um, and really build that self to part relationship. So I thought that was fabulous and really interesting. And I think one of the things that I loved about having Chris on here, even is, you know, he's fun to talk to. And I don't know if everyone feels this way about their level one trainers, but um, I just have this special fondness for him. I just admire him, I think. And so I wanted to know because he's a, um, a lead trainer. And so he's, you know, working with all the other lead trainers and Dick and, and, um, he, I think I say it in the episode that he came up with a level two, like the material for level two. So he's in the mix of what is kind of coming down from the top. Like what are the top people in the IFS Institute wanting us to know and to learn? And so one of the things that I found really interesting is that he talks about how parts are fluid and not static. I'm wondering what you guys think about that, because I think that that's not kind of how I've thought about them, is like there's a little bit of fluidity to them as they transform, but then once, like I talked about kind of my clipboard manager, like she's always my clipboard manager and this is what she looks like, and what Chris is saying is that's actually not really how it works, and so I thought that was really fabulous, so that's kind of at the end, but so we've got critics, we've got attachment, obviously we've got lots about um, the model, obviously. And um, it's really great. So I hope you like this one. It is March. And so New Hampshire is starting to thaw. I still have snow on the ground, but the sun has been out and I'm feeling like there's some hope. <laughs> so hope everyone's well. Enjoy. Hi. Hi there. How's it going? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. I'm home. My son is sick today, so oh, okay. I know, so I'm home. All right. I like the color of your kitchen. It's pretty. Thank you. We want to do the. Um, we actually painted it probably. I don't know. Re- so recently, but we want to do the cabinets white. But yeah. I'm, right when it looked better if they were white. Yeah. Yeah. So for yeah. everyone listening, my my wall is now like a turquoise blue. Like I've got like a beach theme going and my cabinets are these old 
brown colored. Yeah, I have the same cabinets. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the past three houses I've lived in. Yeah. So I shouldn't talk too badly about the cabinets then. No, I think I need to paint mine too. Well, I want to paint them, but husband says he wants to actually like get new cabinets, which I feel like is a non is a project that like okay maybe in five years I don't know if it's actually going to happen. I'm like just no. If your husband it. wants to do it, let him do it. But is he going to do it? This is the problem. <laughs> That's the problem, right? <laughs> he has lots of grand plans. I think I have the same conversation with my wife. Mm. <laughs> is there any tricks to make you do to get you to encourage you to do something? Um, yeah, if it's like, you know, like we're going to have like this really fun weekend where we do the cabinets. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really fun. We're going to invite, invite your friends over and, you know, get some beers and put on some music and take these cabinets out. You know? that, that sounds good. Yeah. All right. So if your, your wife listens to this now, she knows how to get her cabinets done. Exactly. Right. She's been after me for years. Yeah. So. One thing that has helped him get stuff done is we, when we bought this house, we were like, it's a tiny, tiny house and it's on a river and it had this window and we're like, okay, we want to put, so eventually we put these doors in, mm -hmm. it's this way. Yeah. So we put these doors in mm -hmm. and then we put a deck on and the idea was to do half the deck was going to be an enclosed screen porch and half the deck was just going to be like a deck, like a grill or something. But then we never did the enclosed screen porch. So when my son was a baby, it didn't even have like railings because we were going to put a porch on it. Mm -hmm. So I would lay these like chairs everywhere so he wouldn't like crawl over. We'd have play dates with all these babies and their moms and they would be like, why don't you have any rails on this mm -hmm. deck? Mm -hmm. Like, well, because eventually we're going to mm -hmm. put a screen and porch. Mm -hmm. And the only reason the screen and porch ever happened was because we like refinanced or something. And they mm -hmm. said it was one of the things that they said we had to do. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> So it happened. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like he'd rather do other things. And is that how you feel too? You'd yeah, absolutely. I'd rather play tennis. I'd rather do anything. I'd rather do anything. Yeah. yeah. I was mm -hmm. thinking that about, I went for a walk. I don't, there are houses situated so it's facing the river. And so I, I always walk, our driveway pulls up to the side of the house and I walk up to the side of the house. So I never see the front of our house. Mm -hmm. And so I went for a walk the other day and I saw the front of the house and we have like a big bay window and it's like peeling and stuff. And I was like, yeah, we really need to work on that. I'm like, yeah, but we'd rather go kayaking. We'd exactly. rather go to the beach. We'd rather go do fun stuff. Like we're not going to like, yeah. Stay home. Like I think our our parents did that, right? They stayed home and like worked on the house all weekend. Right. Yeah. I'd rather do lots of other things. So, yeah. Yeah. And tell everybody where you live and all the fun uh, things around where you live. Yeah, I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, if you're gonna live in North Carolina, that's the place to be. Um, so yeah. Well, so that's of, a that's a strong statement. Like, what about Wilmington? When I'd rather that's a good place. Well, it depends on if you're a mountain or ocean person. Wilmington's a good place. But you feel strongly like if you're going to live in North Carolina, Asheville is the place to live. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, we have nine, nine rivers within an hour and a half of ourselves. You can kayak all year round. We're one of the few places in the world you can whitewater kayak all year round. Wow. Um, you know, so it's uh, – and it's, you know, it's great. But don't tell anybody because it's uh, – too many people are moving here. So. Yeah. yeah, I won't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny? I think that's so true. It's like once you live somewhere, you're like, this is so great. Don't tell anybody. I don't want anyone else to live here. Yeah. It gets yeah. Crowded. It's it's great. It's wonderful, though. It's not too crowded yet. But. Well, that must be nice because I love where I live, but six months out of the year, it's too cold to do anything. We can ski and snowshoe and stuff like that, but. Yeah. But now I couldn't do that. No. <laughs> so if you look outside right now, like if I look outside right now, I see snow. It's mm -hmm. sunny and it rains, so there's like ice on the trees and stuff. So if you look outside, what do you say? Um, I'm sort of on top of a hill, so I've got uh, I've got a woods in front of me, and and we have bears and turkeys, and you know, so so yeah, I, I'm lucky to live, you know, sort of up in the mountains, and, um, and I get to stay here all day. I don't have to go anywhere. So that's oh, great. that's good. That's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. So you, I know you travel the world training and then do you have a private practice too that you yeah. have an office to, or do you just do online stuff? Uh, I have an office and I do online stuff. Um, but yeah, I see clients. I still, you know, I still really um, do a lot of trauma work. And um, so I do it 
online. I have um, clients also come to my office here, but you know, I've stayed pretty, um, pretty steeped in, um, you know, working, I've worked with trauma for, I don't know, my whole career, 20, 25 years now almost. Um, but I still see a lot of really pretty severe trauma work and, you know, so still, you know, kind of where my love is, is, is working, doing trauma work. So, mm-hmm. um, and how did you, was it through your interest in working in trauma that you found IFS? Yeah, I, I studied a parts model by uh, a gentleman named David Kaloff, who was uh, sort of an early um, trauma specialist. And um, I worked at a United Family Services and probably within six months of me taking a job, 85% of my cases were cases of sexual abuse. So we were, and we, so David was coming in and, and teaching us to do trauma work. Um, and his model is a parts model. Um, one of the early parts models, he and Dave, he and Dick and, um, Mike Elkin were all sort of presenters at the, the networker conference and, um, you know, and, and they were in a study group together and, And so I think Dick kind of learned a good bit of parts work from David, but back then it was really kind of using, you know, parts work to work with disassociative identity disorder. And David was starting to apply a bit of that to everybody. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I think Richard Schwartz or Dick um, took a lot of David's work and just really, organized it and developed it and listened to the clients and did a beautiful job of really kind of teasing the model out, you know, from different places. And, um, you know, and so, but yeah, I studied with David probably 10 years before I met Dick and, um, you know, so, uh, so is I've David been still around. What is he doing? Uh, David's still around. He's written a book, um, and he's in Seattle and, um, He's, I don't think he's sort of touring as much anymore, but, but yeah, he's a, he's a beautiful guy. So you got in early on. I did. I, my first training, I did my first training in, uh, 1999 and PA'd in 2001 and was assistant trainer by, I think it was assistant trainer in 2003. Um, you know, and, and then I was a co-lead for, um, I liked co-leading a lot. I co-led with uh, uh, Karen Bashirs, um, who was a, um, a leader trainer at the time. So Karen and I trained together in Asheville. We we ran a lot of IFS trainings here, and so I co I really love co-leading. Co-leading doesn't pay anything, so you can't stay as a co-leader. Um, but but we did. I did that for five or six years, and then I think 2010 was my first solo lead trainer training. And so then I've been kind of doing a lot of it since then. Mm. How do you balance out like the trainings that you do with your family? And because I know you have two young kids. Yes, yeah, challenging. You, yeah. you know, I, I was away too much in the past um, five or six years. I traveled way too much. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a challenge to balance everything. Um, you know, and my my daughter's a senior in high school, so I'm trying not to travel very much this year. And uh, and maybe she might do a gap year and hang around next year, so I might not travel much next year either. If she does a gap year and hangs out here a little bit. Do you have a? Um, is there a part of you that has an opinion about what she should do? Uh, I think she shouldn't be a therapist. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, no. Why? No. Why? You know, I think, I don't know. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging job. It's a difficult job. You know, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it requires a lot of growth on our part, but it, we carry a lot, you know, and, you know, I mean, you know, I used to say, you know, we, we hear the worst stories imaginable, you know, on a daily basis, you know, so that's, that's, so we have to learn not to absorb those things and, not carrying them. I think IFS really helps, you know, my early, in my early years, you know, I, or by Friday I was a zombie, you know, mm. cause I just absorbed everything. And, um, and I had to learn and I had vulnerable parts that absorbed everything. And I had, I had young teenagers that was working hard to fix my mom, 
you know, so those parts were working hard too. So by the time I, even though I had grew up with, or I came along with a parts model, by the time I got to IFS, I was burned out and I was really fried. I had, I'd had a year where I had um, shingles and, you know, and was in bad shape by the time I find IFS. And then I discovered these parts of me that were absorbing my client's feelings and I was feeling my client's feelings and I was overworking and I had parts of ruminating about trying to help my clients, you know, so everybody, my system, all, everybody was working way too hard. Yeah. And, um, and that was part of the burnout. And, um, you know, so I don't feel that way anymore. I feel, you know, I feel refreshed and energized and I, I sort of stay in my own energy bubble and, you know, and I don't feel my clients feelings, you know, I don't, that's commiserating. That's not compassion. Mm. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, for me, I wouldn't be a therapist anymore. I don't think if I had found IFS, I think I'd be selling insurance or maybe in, installing cabinets, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Selling insurance would not be, that's yeah. not horrible. Oh, well, anything was, was feeling better not than oh. the therapy way I was doing it. <laughs> okay. Well, that's pretty bad then. You're like insurance would be better. I had two thoughts about that. One is that there is this thing that's been happening to me recently that I thought was, it's really curious. That's like when I'm sitting, when I'm sitting doing therapy, it's like the sad, horrible stories doesn't, don't land on like younger parts of me. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a friend who's a special ed teacher and she's been we this has happened twice where we were at like a pizza party with all of our kids and she has told me like a horrific story involving a young child and I'm mm -hmm. like sitting there with like wine mm -hmm. and it almost like it's almost like I have no protection mm -hmm. and I've been thinking and then like it almost like hits me like I almost she's telling me this and my eyes are wide and I can feel it I can feel mm -hmm. that I'm being super mm -hmm affected mm -hmm. by this horrible story she's telling me yeah yeah and, it, and it's actually happened twice and i'm like i don't know yeah well i think of it i think of it a little bit like you know what you <laughs> yeah that's cute what you have is um you know you're at the at a party your parts are kind of out celebrating with you you know yeah and it's a little bit like you might not tell that story if you're in the car with your children Right. You know, because your children are listening. So your parts are there celebrating and partying with you, you know, and, and they're listening to it. And I think it's recognizing like, hey, like, you know, I, I can't listen to this story right now. Like my kids, my, my inner kids are like, they're, you know. Yeah. And, and a little bit, there's a little bit like that, you know, um, like even sort of in, like on Saturdays, my, my wife will ask me something like, we've been trying to write some. and like, do you want to write? And I'm like, no, my teenagers are way too active to want to write today. You know, they don't, they don't want to sit down and write. You know, my teenagers never want to sit down and write. They, they want to be out, you know, playing, you know, so now nah, my, my inner parts are way too, you know, they're, they're like, they want to like listen to music and, you know, yeah. have some fun. And that's that's one of the things I think that makes this idea of multiplicity amazing and to help us really understand like why is there times that I can actually wrap my head around writing or wrap my head around this horrible story or be be present and compassionate and there are other times when I can't and there's plenty of times when I'm like I can't even think about my schedule but then there's other times when I'm like mm -hmm. no problem and I'm like taking care of it and it makes a ton of sense it depending on what parts are up yeah the energy that I'm in and the urges and desires that I'm having. Yeah, I think so. I think it helps us a lot, you know, cause what, I mean, we all have these, and we, you know, part of our docket a little bit, let's talk about critics, but we all, we all have these parts of ourselves that tries to help us, but they've learned to do it in a harsh way, you know, and because that, they, that kind of works, but, you know, so we, because of what you're describing, Tammy is different, different times are in certain different modalities and, we could have a critic that gets hard on us because, you know, what's, what's, why can't I focus? Well, it's Saturday and I'm not supposed to focus, you know, like your little guy, he's running around. He's, he's not focused, you know, he's, no. he's, he's, it's not school. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's the like, Tylenol's kicked in. Yeah. The Tylenol's <laughs> kicked in. He's ready to have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and actually, it's interesting you said that because I thought what happens is there is a critic that says, I should be able to handle that story. And mm-hmm. she doesn't have she doesn't have anyone else. This is probably maybe like a people pleaser or have to be everything to everybody part that says she doesn't have anyone else to talk to. Like she can't tell the story to the stay at home mom that's sitting right there. You know what I mean? Like she yeah. she only has so you should be I able should to listen. handle it. And I should be able to I, handle it. Yeah. So that should is a real good indicator that you got a crit- critic working. Yeah. Cr- critics are masters at shoulds. And should is a fear, you know, so, you know, so should, so fear-based response. And that's, so in, until the critics, and maybe we'll talk a little more, critics can, can transform. They don't have to be critics, you know, they don't have to be critics forever, you know, but they're, they are, these parts tend to be major players in our system and they, they tend to try to help us meet the ideal aspects of ourselves. You know, so there are parts of ourselves that sees the discrepancy between maybe how we are as human beings and how we are ideally. Okay. And so they stay a bit focused on our ideal self and they've learned to use uh, harshness or fear to try to help us reach our ideal. And so what you're describing is ideally this is who I should be. You know, and yeah. it's trying to help you meet meet that ideal, you know, with having a should in there, which the rest of our apartment, the rest of our system starts to respond to a should, you know, because a should is sort of a, you know, it's a bit of a shame based response. You know, if I don't meet this and somehow I fail, you know, which is a fear, the fear of failing. So that's a system that works really well to motivate us to try to meet our ideals. Um, the challenge for the critics is they don't they don't know that we we actually aspire to be a better aspects of ourselves and and the inspiration is 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 more quiet it's not as loud as fear you know but it, we all everybody carries it everybody like as Dick says that self energy carries a motivation you know towards health and wholeness and you know and um, you know so we have we have a a natural motivation in our system for it. You know, if you, if you watch kids, kids naturally want to learn that they just, this just needs to be fun for them. You know, and we've, we've lost like how to make, you know, I mean, school wasn't much fun for me, you know, but, but, but when we're having fun, when, you know, the natural state of learning is having fun, you know, so, so there's a natural internal motivation The the critics have not, they just haven't learned to trust that, you know, mm. Mm. Yeah, so it's like they think, well, I'm just going to hammer you more, and that's what will that's what will motivate you, and that's what will make you the ideal self is just more louder, more critical, more energy, more yeah, intensity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, some reason, some reason, the critics, my critic, it kind of mimicked my football coach, and and I, you know, once I started working with it, I'm, I'm like, like you sound a lot like my football coach. You know, and, um, and it's like, yeah, you know, he he was the one that one of my, one of my parts was saying to me, he's the one that really got you to be tough. He's the one that got you to, to really perform higher than you ever thought you could, you know. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, he was an asshole, you know. So, so why do you want to mimic him? You know, it worked, you know. And that's, that's you know, so the, the parts are, you know, they kind of mimic someone that, maybe in there maybe that kind of worked you know or someone that seemed to have power or influence you know and and they they didn't tend, tend to mimic other people that actually was empowering you know um, yeah you know so so that's a lot of, a lot of my work is that the belief that really these critics can transform they have just formed they have just formed a poor way of helping us but the way they helped us is actually actually works um, it actually has helped save our lives or helped us be successful or, you know, helped us be more organized or helped us be different than a family member that we didn't want to be like, you know, so they, there's a lot of, there's kind of a lot of at stake, um, yeah. you know, so fear is a, you know, is a, it's a high energy motivator, you know, but it's, it's exhausting. So. Yeah. Well, and it has other responses from other parts. You, you, there's other. Exactly, exactly right. Um, but then when those critics transform with self 
energy and um, going to what they're protecting, I'm guessing. Yeah. What younger parts they're protecting. Yeah, I think the the process, I think the process uh, that I'm, you know, noticing a bit is one is they have to be introduced that they actually could do it differently. Okay. Yeah. You know, they don't know it because it's, you know, like if something works all the time, but it has, you know, consequences, as you just said, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of give up something that works, even if, even if you have something that works better. Um, yeah. You know, so that's a, that's a bit of a hard transition. So the, the first phase is to introduce that there is another way, you know, and, yeah. and then to kind of help the part experience another way, you know, and then to see, as you just indicated, how other, how other parts of the system respond to that, mm. you know, because the, the, the critic tends to produce shame and it tends to make the younger parts feel bad, you know, and, and then they kind of shut down or withdraw then the critic has to hammer them more, you know, to, to try to, you know, sort of like to get them to pop up, but they don't pop up. They tend to go deeper into the shame, right. you know, so then it becomes a vicious cycle that it gets locked into. I like that thinking though sometimes. So sometimes I think like to, to transform a part, let's say like transform the critic that you have to do the whole protocol, but it's like, wait, if I just introduce this idea that there is another way and letting that part see that other parts are reacting, that, that it's pr actually producing shame, that that could actually just, that could be so transformative. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that's, um, that's kind of where, where I, in, Oftentimes, the critic has a myopic view. You know, it's not, it does, it, it sees the outcome. You know, it sees like, okay, when I hammer you, you do get your paperwork done. You know, and, you know, and, and all the therapists struggle with that. Right. You know, it's yeah. a common theme, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really see, but, but when I do that, you feel really bad about yourself, you know, and you you feel, you know, like a terrible therapist, which then makes you feel bad later. And, you know, it doesn't sort of see the outcome of it. So it's, that's why we sort of refer to these parts kind of like firefighters. They don't see the destruction that they're creating. Yeah. You know? And I was thinking that, that when my critic gets really, when my critic starts hammering at me about a mistake that I've made or, um, I didn't do something right, or I should have, I should be the kind of person or that, you know, if I was a good friend, I'd listen to my friend, then that then triggers, so that triggers shame. And then that triggers behaviors that I don't really like, whether it's sleeping too much or eating too much, or that triggers another mm -hmm. firefighter to kind of right. calm, it, calm it all down. Yeah. Which amps up the critic again. <laughs> so this, this, this is a horrible vicious cycle. <laughs> oh heavens to Betsy! Yeah, yeah, and we're, and we're all work, walking around with these vicious cycles that we can't figure out how to get out of. Yeah. Um, you know, so if we look at a lot of our clients are coming in, you know, because of this vicious cycle that they're trapped into, they, yeah. they can't get out of it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I like to try to work with critics. Um, I sort of teach, you know, see if you can at least kind of help the critic soften you know, early in the work. And I, I do it a little differently that way. Cause if you think about normal family therapy, if, if you've got a, if you've got like four or five family members sitting in a room together and one of them is really mean or harsh, you're not going to ask the rest of the family to get vulnerable, you know, cause they're going to get beaten up, you know? So you're going to, you're going to start with safety, which you're going to work with the harsh, that harsh, the harsh member of the family, to find out why they're harsh and why they feel like they need to do that and what they're hoping to accomplish and how is this protective and, you know, and if they could figure out another way to, to, to protect people without being harsh, would they be interested in that? Mm -hmm. You know, so we, so we would do that normal family therapy and somehow we think we can work our internal system and bypass that member and that that member won't cause repercussions, you know, so that, that doesn't make sense in family therapy. Right. And so the common sense is to work with that critic first and create an, an internal s safety in the system, you know, and, you know, and, and we may have to work a bit more with the vulnerable parts, you know, before the, that part's willing to shift a whole lot, but at least it can, it can mitigate itself a little bit just yeah. by introducing this idea that, 
you don't have to be harsh to get your point across here. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And actually I was just thinking how often, um, maybe parts of me don't like the critic in my patient, right? Sort of don't like that part. And then I, so I want to bypass to be like, okay, and, and the person doesn't like that part. So I'm sort of, my parts joining with their part, not liking the critic. Mm -hmm. So then, so, and then I'm like, okay, well, no, we want to talk about your anxiety, right? So let's talk about your, you are anxious about this thing. So then I don't want to talk about the critic, but then the critic keeps coming in and then we don't get to talk about the anxiety or whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. David would always say, you know, we're all pretty happy to work with the warm, cuddly parts, but those mean ones, you know, we all want to shy away from. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. so so yeah, uh, but I think that's a natural tendency to to do to do that. Yeah, and I and I'm yeah, and I'm also feeling like, man, if we could get the critic with all that great energy to shift a little bit, yeah, that would make a huge difference in the system. Exactly. I think that's why I say critics are major players, you know, because they're, you know, I mean, my critics like, I mean, he's much more, this part's much more soft and gentle. You know, it's like yesterday I have a client coming to my office today and my, my desk was just really messy. And my, you know, and my, my part says, you know, your desk looking kind of messy is just not going to give a great impression you know, and, you know, when I do video work, no one can see it, you know, and, you know, but it was really nice about it. You know, it's not going to give a great impression and, you know, you know, why don't, why don't we just tidy it up a little bit, you know, and, and it'll, and you'll be happy with it, you know, and, wow. you know, but it's a major player, but it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's really nice the way you're talking to me, you know, it's like, you know, like you're right. And I, I did, I got my desk really tidy and it looks really pretty and, you know, and but it, yeah, but then that's the reinforcement piece. You know, it's when when the parts kind of do help you in the way that you've asked them to help, then you have to reinforce that. You know, by responsiveness to them, and 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 for me, it's uh, it's it's a bit of a daily. It's a da- it's like a relationship. A relationship needs it needs reinforcement. You know, and if if you neglect a relationship for months and months and months, the other person's not going to be really happy with you. Right. You know? Yeah. And, you know, and so it's um, you know, especially if there's a commitment that you've made uh, in the mm. relationship. So you've you've made this commitment with the part, you know, to have this ongoing relationship. So you have to sort of follow up with it, you know, by actually listening to it when it when it does do things in a way that you're you've asked it to do that. Um, so. Yeah. You can't you can't neglect you can't neglect your internal system and expect it to to stay in harmony. Um, yeah, I, that is such a good point. That it's like you can go to therapy or or training or something, and you could learn about your system, and then you can make these. And I've done this before, like made a commitment. Yep, make a commitment to check in with this part. Then life gets busy. Blah 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 blah. Then all of a sudden, the part comes back up and is even more agitated or whatever. And it's like, oh, why? I thought I worked with this part, and it's like. <laughs> Right. I think right. That's, that's when we say this, this therapy doesn't work. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk about another issue that I'm having that I mm. think is um, about attachment, mm-hmm. which is I know that one of the things that we wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other issue that I'm having is, and there's a part of me that feels like this is really silly. Mm. This is a silly issue. Is that a critic that sort of right. tells you that? <laughs> yeah, this is silly. He's yeah. going to think you're stupid. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, that's that part not to be so harsh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, as soon as you said that, I could actually feel my shoulders just like droop down mm. a little bit. No, yeah, because it relaxes a little bit. All right. Okay. That, that feels good. Yeah. Um, so here is an, and it's an ongoing issue that I have. So say, um, my friend say at that say at at that party right the special the my the pizza party with all the kids and all that stuff and say i have a really good conversation with sally so then i then think say there's a friday and then Mm -hmm. sally and i have a really good conversation and then i don't hear from her there's a part of you that then expects sally and i are now going to be best friends Mm -hmm. and she's going to text me and i don't and then so then i don't hear from her i'm like well that's weird so i might text her like kind of keeping that like connection or intensity of 
like we talked on Friday and we had this amazing connection on Monday. I might be like, how's your week? What's going on? And she might just give me like, Hey, hope you have a great week. I'll see you in a few weeks. And mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, see you in a few weeks. No, 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 no. Like mm -hmm. we just had this connection mm -hmm. and now we're not going to talk for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. That feels weird for me. Mm -hmm. And I've, and I've learned that that's like normal and like not to do that, not to like do that to people. Cause mm -hmm. this happens to me all the time where I'm mm -hmm. at church or I'm at school or, and people like talk to me, like we're best friends. Mm -hmm. And then there's no other. And then I feel like, wait, I thought, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it, and I feel like it's, and I, maybe this it feels like it's strange that I'm like, oh, we're just going to have this maybe once a month really fantastic conversation mm -hmm. and that's, that's going to be it. That's, that's. Yeah. So from an attachment lens, what we might look at a little bit is that, um, so that object constancy, you know, the, that, that constancy of, you know, that you're going to be there, you know, and I know you're going to be there mm. and you're not going to go away. You know, that that's a developmental need for when we're really young, um, that we sort of need that object constancy, mm. um, you know. And so if somehow that gets disrupted and we don't trust it, you know, then there's parts of us sort of still playing that out, you know, and it gets played out in lots of different um, arenas, you know. And so the, so, you know, so looking at, so what we might would do, you know, if, if you're doing work and attachment work is we might, we might look at those parts that didn't get the consistency of that, uh, that constancy and is looking for that. Um, you know, and the great thing about with IFS is now you're, you're able to be the constant for the part, you know, and, and it, then it's not sort of looking for that, you know, everywhere else. Um, you know, and then you, in what you said, and there's some part of you that knows like, okay, so this come close, go away, come close, go away is normal, you know, and different people have different levels of engagement, you know, and, and you know, there's some people that they engage once a month and that's the nature of their close friendships. And some, some folks engage like, you know, every two hours, you know, and that's the level of their engagement, you know, but different people have le different levels of engagement and that doesn't necessarily mean it's the you know the the you know the um sum total of the quality of the relationship um, but um so some part of you sort of knows that you know there's this there's this other part of you that's really looking for that that constancy that consistent figure um mm -hmm. you know that maybe maybe somehow got interrupted some way um, yeah and no and yeah, and I know my childhood, and so that actually makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking about that I had, like, you know, I had, like, a security object for a long time, mm -hmm. um, like a security blanket sort of thing for a really long time. My parents mm -hmm. were divorced, yada, yada, yada. So mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that actually makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. And that the other thing that's kind of funny to me is well, there's another part of me that's like, I don't want all these friends. Like, I don't, I don't. I don't mm -hmm. want to be, you know, I don't want to be friends. It's, it's this confusion yeah. of like why we have this intense conversation and then I don't, it, so it's almost, yeah. It's, there's, yeah. And that's, sort of, and that's sort of a, the other side of that, that inconsistent, um, you know, parenting, you know, is it another protector? You know, that's kind of the way that your parts may have compensated for it is I, I want it, but then I don't want it you know, cause it hurts yeah. too bad to want it and to not get it, you know? So there's, so, you know, the parts sort of develop a, a bit of these patterns around, you know, longing for it, but then being angry and being, or they might move to self-reliance or, you know, or right, they might, right. they might move the anger um, because, you know, the, the figure isn't constant with them, you know, so there's can be multiple layers to that, you know, which gets a little confusing you know, because you've got in the IFS, we talk about a polarization, you know, a part that wants, wants this closeness, another part that, you know, has sort of convinced itself it doesn't want it to compensate for whatever hurt it that happens when people go away. Um, you know, so you, so you have different, 
you know, you know, parts have different sort of attachment wounds and different ways of compensating for that, which is quite normal for children to adjust, um, you know, to those dynamics. Um, you know, so the the little parts carry those those early dynamics um, that that got set up. That's one of the another gifts of I, gift of IFS is the idea of self then can be that like repairer of the attachment wounds that happened when yeah. we were little. Yeah, I think it. I think it does. I think it goes both ways. You know, you know. I I think the no the misnomer that people hear about IFS is you know, is, is I got to be everything for myself is what IFS is saying. And, and that's sort of not true. It's uh, relationships are highly important in an, an attachment, you know, to our spouses or, you know, to our significant others or to our children, you know, that these, these relationships are highly important. So no one is saying that you're supposed to be solo independent, you know, you the self just take care this takes care of ourself. Like all you know, I need is self. All I need is all self. I, and yeah. you know, and I don't, they're not saying that at all. You know, it helps to have it helps to have you know, a, a an internal dynamic that's self soothing and self calming and that we can listen and befriend ourselves and care for these aspects of ourselves. And then we can negotiate those relationships, you know. And but there is some soothing. At least we kind of know what's going on, and we may be able to kind of heal that, you know. So it's it's, a, it's not quite so extreme, you know. Or it doesn't jump into the driver's seat, you know. But we then we can also then we have a self leadership to negotiate it, you know. Like you know, one of one of my friends, um, he he likes to be. He's one of those like we could talk every hour, and he would be happy with that, you know. And we would sort of process all of our stuff with each other, you know, and, and that's not me. I'm, I'm the one that, you know, if we talk once a week, I'm pretty happy, you know? And so we had to negotiate, you know, the level of our engagement, you know, and, but, but I could sort of do that for a self-led part. Like if we're going to be really good friends, like, like I know that you like a lot of engagement. I'm a little bit more introverted than you. You're extroverted. We're, we're going to have to kind of find a, a balance here of, engagement that feels right to both of us, you know, right. and how about we talk about this? This relationship is important to the both of us. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what, you know, what feels, you know, like the right amount, you know, and, you know, I, I can't sort of process all of your relationship issues with you. You know, that's not me, you know, like, you know, right. like, you know, I can, I can process a little bit with you, but every time we have breakfast, I can't hear about, your girlfriend issues, you know, that's, you know, it's like, you know, like we got to talk about something else, you know, and if you know, maybe you want to hire a therapist for that, but yeah, you know, that, yeah. But, you know so there's a, but we're, but the negotiation comes from a self led way, which is around how are we going to cooperate and how are we going to be mm. in relationship to each other? Um, you know, and then what do we know about each other? What do we know about our own internal system? You right, because it's like if you are saying that to him and he has some attachment wounding that is is uh, a part that's just really uh, – I'm kind of doing a grabby thing with my hand, sort of like – like I don't want to say needy because that sounds judgmental, but sort of just really needing – for you to be that security object maybe. Yeah. And so then, so right. So then if that could, if what you're saying lands on that part, then, then that's, so I guess what I'm trying to say is this is where our attachment wounds and our external relationships meet. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that yeah. make sense? So that yeah, if, absolutely. I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm being there for my parts that need that, um, consistency, then in, in self is being there for them and with them and being in the consistent object for them, then they aren't going to be as needy to grab it from my external relationships. So then I can show up differently in my external relationships. Yeah, that's right. Is that exactly. right? Sort of that how that's that right. attachment stuff actually comes into your, like how it applies to your external relationships that yeah. are important. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, and it so there's uh, yeah, so there's there's more clarity in the relationship. You know, there's more like he can say, you know, I know that I have parts that have a lot of high interpersonal needs, you know, but and it doesn't have to come from you, you know. It's mm -hmm. I can, you know, like my friend has lots of he's an extrovert, he has lots of friends, you know, he has a very intimate relationship with his wife. He has lots of places for those high 
relational needs to get met, you know, and so he Does knows Does he have that. a wife and a girlfriend? No, no. Oh, yeah. There's two different friends. Sorry. I'm like, wait. Well, this sounds very I'm, exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm sort of like, I'm sort of combining these two friends. That's okay. Yeah, one, one of them has a girlfriend, one of them has a wife, you know. So I have two high, high need friends, uh, you know. Kind of interesting, Chris. Thanks for clarifying about that. But you um, they have sort of that, you know, for, for him to be able to negotiate to know what his internal needs are, you know, then he can, you know, then he can navigate those. System. What about this idea, and I've heard this in sessions where it's like, well, I didn't get my needs met from my mom, and so I can't go back and do that now. You know, like that, mm. that idea of like, well, my mom wasn't there for me, so what am I supposed to do about that now? This isn't, you know, so this isn't helping talking about this, um, and so how do you handle that when people say that? Yeah, they... I think that we have parts that really are really trying to complete what they weren't able to complete as children, you know? So if my, if I could figure out a way for my mom to be there for me, you know, in the way I wish she could have back then, you know, then you know, everything would be so much better. And, and it's, you know, and it's, it's challenging when parents don't have those skill sets, you know, to be able to be there in that way. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. interesting we say that in uh in relationships too, right? Sort of this we're look that um I like that way you just said that that we're trying to complete so then like say my dad was an alcoholic and so then I end up marrying an alcoholic and then it's like why do I see keep picking the same type of men? And it's mm-hmm. that idea, right? It's that your parts are trying to complete something or that re- looking for redemption or trying to redeem your parent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is attachment issue, is attachment wounds, right? Yeah, yeah. It's something actually Freud talked about. Is that you know? Then then the uh, MAGA folks talked about it. Is that we we tend to find someone that's going to bring up our unfinished business, but also has the potential to heal it. You know, so there's also that potential to heal in that person, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what attracts us to them is the potential to heal it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it and sometimes people they do do their work, and that potential to heal is there. Um, you know, I, I think what IFS brings is that that's actually someone else can't heal your internal wounds. Um, you know, that it, it really takes that self to part relationship, you know, the, to kind of heal that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I say this too, it's not something I think we can do by ourselves. Um, you know, like Ron Kurtz, the, you know, the, the Hakomi, the, the, the man who sort of developed Hakomi, which IFS takes a lot from Hakomi. And he says that, you know, I, you can't heal you and I can't heal you, you know, but together we create a space where healing occurs, you know, so I think that's, you know, I think that's a very important, um, because there, there is a bit in the kind of IFS literature out there, some around that you should be able to do this work on your own. And there's a certain amount of the work that you can do your on your own. But I think healing or exiles, I haven't been able to heal my own exiles. You know, I, I go to someone that's a healer to, to create that space for me to, so I can do my own healing work. Um, mm. So I think it's really important that people really hear that there's not an expectation that you should be able to heal your own exiles. I think, um, you know, and, you know, then we get critical of ourselves if we can't. But, right. yeah. um, but I think, yeah, I think that's, I think we do, we look for someone that's going to be, you know, a redeemer in some way that's going to redeem our, to redeem our self-worth or that's going to complete that unfinished business that we didn't have growing up, you know, that, and we find people that have potential to that. Uh, potential isn't really actuality. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, potential just leads to like disappointment and frustration and. Yeah. At least hopefully we're all, you know, hiring people with potential. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Well, and if you work with, with people with trauma, then you're, you know that you're dealing with parts that have attachment wounds all the time. Yeah. I think, I think, I think we're all working around with attachment wounds. I think, I think because we've, we've gotten disengaged, we've gotten disconnected from ourselves. We've gotten, you know, we, most people, walk around with some type of harshness trying to uh, mitigate their internal system. That's an attachment wound. Um, 
parts separating from other parts or attachment wounds. So I think attachment applies to our own internal system, you know, and I, I think IFS is a way of healing internally attachment, you know, so we're, we're reattaching to parts of ourselves and we're, uh, and we're forming more secure attachment with ourselves. You know, so I think it applies. I think I think IFS is really attachment work, and that we're reattaching to these parts of ourselves that we've gotten detached from. You know, and we're forming, we're forming. You know, we're we're sort of meant to have a more harmonious system. You know, and um, you know, and we've gotten more disengaged from that. Um, and you can see that in the way that we are in the world, the way that we are with the planet, with the way that we're connected, disconnected from nature, you know, that this disconnection is sort of showing up everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, it's, uh, it, we weren't sort of meant to live like that. I don't think, I think we we're meant to live in a connective con- community and more harmonious with ourselves and more harmonious with nature. And, mm-hmm. you know, so we've gotten, um, we've gotten away from that. That was beautiful. <laughs> you said that beautifully. Thank you. What is it that we haven't said that you feel like you really want listeners to, to hear? Um, I think the tendency, and I sort of look at, I look at the work and I look at the literature a bit that comes out. I think the tendency a little bit is to try to think of parts as stagnant, you know, that we have, we have sort of this part that has this characteristic or this character form. And I, I like to teach that parts are much more fluid. You know, our brain is fluid. There's a lot of plasticity of the brain. Parts are kind of like that too. The parts really have potential to transform and change. And, um, and so they're not stagnant. So we, if we make a part like this is my manager or this is my firefighter and we form it, we may need to kind of have a bit of a, a particle to it to begin to work with it. But I think it's really important for people to see parts much more fluid, much more, you know, um, able to shift and change and um, become, um, you know, kind of what they were born to be, you know. So we're, you know, so we're, you know, I think overall as a culture, we're starting to see that people are much more fluid, you know, and much less static, you know, even the way that we begin to look at gender and, um, you know, and sexual identity, those types of things that there's, there's much more fluidity to a, a range of adaptability and range of um, expressions. So it's important to allow that same freedom for your parts to, to be able to shift and change and transform into kind of what they're meant to be. Um, so it's, and I think it's important for IFS therapists to s- see parts in that way. Um, you know, cause once we, once we sort of see, if we see a critical part as the critical part and we make it into the critical part and we make it to a certain critical part, then we we put it in a static form and we don't really hold the perspective and potential that maybe this part doesn't want to be critical at all. You know, maybe what it really wants to be is our internal advocate, you know, or our champion, you know, or the, or our nurturer, you know, so it, you know, so it, we don't, we want to create um, space for that part to transform into the way it wants to be. So that's a little bit of my soapbox on, you know, on really making sure that people that are doing IFS work really sees the full spectrum of what the potential transformation of the system and transformation of parts, you know, can, can become, you know, so, you know, so try not to put them into static particles, you know, that, they're, they're much more adaptable and, and there's much more plasticity in the brain than these kind of frozen. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, well, I, and, I, and I love that hearing it from you because I know you're like on the front lines of like what's, what we're training people now and what I know you, the level two that I did, I think you rewrote the, um, you and I think someone else rewrote the deepening and expanding level two. So okay. I know you're on the front lines of like what, what are, what are people being trained at and what are, you know, what's the feedback that you're getting and what are people not picking up? And I try, try to, you know, Facebook helps a lot. I read a lot of the posts and, you know, and um, I, I'm also, I'm also very proud of the consistency I see um, across the board on a lot of the, the, the chats, you know, that I mean, people really get the model and they, they, they really give good advice to each other. Um, and so I'm, 
I'm happy. I think that overall that we've done a good job in the last, you know, 20 years of training the model consistently, um, you know, because I see the reflections, the reflections back are very congruent, you know, with the way that we learned the model, the way it was originally written. And I think we've got a, enough time that we're, we're kind of seeing it's a lot of these principles are standing up, you know, they're, they're, they're not like, they're not going away. And, and I think there's a lot of consistency and sort of proof in that. And um, I just, I just did a client, saw a client this morning and it's a, it's a guy that isn't, hasn't done a lot of therapy, you know, and, and he said, I can't believe how well you get my system, mm-hmm. you know? And, and he said, I didn't think anyone understood me as a musician. And really it wasn't really me getting his system. It was, you know, that like we, we have learned a little bit of how these systems operate, you know, and, and, and human systems operate. And so it was really just sort of reflecting back kind of how we know these systems work, you know, but to, to kind of have, um, you know, to kind of have that feeling that someone sees us and gets us, you know, that's a hallmark of attachment. And attachment is we want to be seen, we want to be understood and we want to be valued. And, you know, and that's, you know, and that's kind of what we're doing. And when we're befriending our parts is we're seeing, you know, we're listening to them, we're understanding them, we're valuing them. So we're doing attachment, internal attachment work, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's, that's what we want in our external attachments too, is to be seen, valued and, um, you know, and understood. Um, so That's beautiful. Yeah. Anything else you can think of? That was great, Chris. Mm. <laughs> well, thanks. Mm. Um, no, I think I think it's it's great to have a you know you said before it is great to have a career that you still feel enlightened with, you mm. know, and you, you know, and I I think the work is you know pretty excited to do the work every day because it's it's a new discovery. It's like visiting a, a whole new planet, you know, and you, you know, and so so the the therapy gets really you know, it stays enlivened and stays exciting to, mm. to get to know people's systems and get to know how they want to change and transform. So, you know. Yeah, so, that's totally different than where you were before in that burnout. Completely, totally different. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was trying to manage the world, you know, from where I was before. So. Yeah. yeah. So I always ask at the end, if you weren't doing all the stuff that you're doing, what mm-hmm. would you be doing instead? Oh, uh, you know, I could probably play tennis six days a week. <laughs> do you go off the? Do you come off the mountain to play tennis, or do you have? Yeah, tennis? no, I don't have it on the mountain. I have to come off the mountain. But yeah, my my perfect day is you know play tennis all morning, have a really great lunch, you know, take a nap, you know, <laughs> and then go to dinner, and then uh, sit by the fire, mm. you know, with the family and read. So that's a that's a pretty perfect day. So um, that sounds so, really good. Yeah. So if I could. If I could do that every day, I would, but there's still lots of work to do. We all, mm. we all have, um, we have to sort of, we have our contribution to make and, you know, and so the world needs us to do that. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.